Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We will continue the discussion on action potential. In the previous session, we closed with this question. This is the resting membrane potential and that is the threshold for opening voltage gated sodium channels. The question was, what takes the membrane potential from the resting potential to the threshold at which voltage, voltage gated sodium channels will open? That is what we will see today, but before that some generalizations. Cells that can develop action potentials are called excitable cells. Here is a list of excitable cells, the nerve cell, different types of muscle cells and even some endocrine cells which develop action potentials prior to exocytosis of the hormone. And cells that do not develop action potentials can be referred to as non-excitable cells. Action potential is a brief period of positivity within a cell, so ion channels in general are considered to shape the membrane potential and we have seen that there are four primary ion channels. That is the direction of ion transport through those channels along their concentration gradients. The direction of current for the cations is in the same direction as that of the ion transport whereas the direction of current for the anion is in the opposite direction. From this it is obvious that sodium and calcium equilibrium potentials will be positive and potassium and chloride equilibrium potentials will be negative. So far we have seen that the resting membrane potential is a case of potassium equilibrium potential in a neuron and many other cells whereas in the case of skeletal muscle both potassium and chloride channels contribute to the resting membrane potential. The action potential is a case of sodium equilibrium potential, though the membrane does not quite reach the sodium equilibrium potential, it is top shot. We also can calculate the exact magnitude of equilibrium potentials for an ion with the Nernst equation. If action potential is a brief period of internal positivity and ion channels contribute to that, then it is logical to assume that an action potential can develop either due to sodium channels opening or calcium channels opening. In the discussion thus far on action potentials, we have not referred to calcium channels. We have restricted ourselves to considering the upstroke of the action potential as due to voltage gated sodium channels, but that is only in the neuron and skeletal muscle. Dr. Anand Baskar, when he considers cardiac muscle action potential, will tell you that they are indeed calcium action potentials. Now, if action potentials are a period of positivity and those cells that can develop action potentials are excitable cells, then it follows that excitable cells should have sodium or calcium channels. By that same logic, we have to say that non-excitable cells do not have voltage gated sodium channels or calcium channels. The contour of the action potential that we have considered in the last class and that we will be considering now are those of the nerve cell and the skeletal muscle cell. Cardiac muscle action potentials will be dealt with by Anand Bhaskar in the next one or two sessions. Now back to our question, we are going to look at what is the cause of this early depolarization and they, then we will consider some properties of voltage gated sodium channels and then repolarization due to delayed rectifiers. This early depolarization or that segment which takes the membrane from the resting potential to the threshold for opening voltage gated sodium channels, it may be called the foot of the action potential and that early depolarization is due to these classes of channels. In different settings, each of these class of channels contributes to the early depolarization and what are these three settings? Here we have a section of the spinal cord that is a lower motor neuron 
which innervates a muscle cell. So here we have the motor end plate or the neuromuscular junction. This is a synapse where an upper motor neuron communicates with a lower motor neuron. So we are going to look at action potentials as they develop in this postsynaptic neuron, action potentials developing in the motor end plate and then action potentials developing in a sensory neuron when there is a sensory stimulus. The sensory receptors that we will consider are touch receptors, specifically the Pacinian corpuscle which is one type of a touch receptor on the skin. This is a cartoon of sensory receptors on the skin. Let this be a receptor, a sensory receptor, a Pacinian corpuscle. Now this is the sensory nerve ending and it is overlaid by many lamellae of acellular tissue and it is these lamellae that give the properties of that particular type of receptor. The receptor is at the resting potential to begin with, let us say. If we record potential difference across the membrane, it is going to be in the resting state and that is due to non-gated potassium channels which are there all over the membrane. Now when you touch there is deformation of the lamellae of the Pacinian corpuscle and that deformation will open mechanosensitive channels on the neuronal membrane. Literally, when you are touched, channels open up. These mechanosensitive channels are non-specific cation channels. So, opening of the mechanosensitive channels will cause an invert current and that will slightly depolarize the membrane the inside will become less negative, a little less negative, though it will not approach positivity. These channels close soon after they open because these lamellae readjust themselves. And because they open and close for a brief period, they produce a very transient depolarization. And that's why these types of channels, there are many of them in different sensory receptors, they are called TRP channels for transient receptor potential channels. So this is what a receptor potential is. It is a small subthreshold depolarization. If such a receptor potential is of sufficient amplitude to reach the threshold, then voltage gated sodium channels will open on the membrane and the membrane will move towards the sodium equilibrium potential. But the property of the voltage gated sodium channels is that they will close immediately and therefore even before the membrane can reach the sodium equilibrium potential which is plus 60 millivolts as we calculated with the Nernst equation, the membrane will not be able to reach that as the sodium channels close quickly. Then a class of potassium channels called delayed rectifiers will open on the neuronal membrane and that is responsible for the repolarization the neuronal membrane will continue to remain at the resting potential due to the non-gated potassium channels which are open all the time. Now you might have a question, while you already have a potassium channel which is open all the time, is just closure of sodium channels at this point not enough to repolarize the membrane? It is possible, but just that it will take longer, longer in terms of milliseconds. There is a need to abbreviate the positivity, to bring the membrane quickly back to resting potential for fast responses in a nerve. We will see that in a while. Therefore, the delayed rectifier potassium channels are very important in abbreviating the period of positivity, in keeping the skeletal and neuronal action potentials very brief of about 2 milliseconds in duration. So, the channel that is responsible for taking the membrane potential to threshold in the Pacinian corpuscle in the touch receptor is the mechanosensitive channel and we find that channel listed here in our table. These are called TRP channels or transient receptor potential channels because these receptor potentials are transient events. They open and close immediately. Well, this opening and closing because of readjustment of the lamellae is a specific property of Pacinian corpuscles. There are other touch receptors which can produce far more sustained depolarizations.
the channels which are responsible for the early depolarization in sensory neurons, in any sensory neuron, pain neuron, touch neuron, auditory neurons. In most of these cases, those channels can be called transient receptor potential channels and that group of channels must have polymodal gating mechanisms if they have to open with different kinds of sensory stimuli in those different locations. The TRP channels are responsible for the early depolarization or the foot of the action potential in sensory neurons. These TRP channels as you see in this table are non-specific cation channels which means they permit all three cations to go past sodium, potassium and calcium. There are some textbooks which refer to these channels, both these classes of channels as sodium channels that is technically incorrect. We will see that more in context when we discuss nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We will now move on to the action potential in a skeletal muscle cell. The foot of the action potential in a skeletal muscle is called the end plate potential and it is due to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We have seen earlier that the end plate potential occurs when acetylcholine is released by the neuron, binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the muscle membrane. These are non-specific monovalent cation channels. Unlike the previous class of mechanosensitive channels we considered, those were non-specific cation channels which would also permit calcium to go past. But the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are non-specific monovalent cation channels which means they will not permit the divalent cation calcium to go through. When they open up, this being a non-specific cation channel, when they open far in excess of the resident leak potassium channels in the membrane, they would take the membrane potential towards their own equilibrium potential. The equilibrium potential for a non-specific cation channel which permits cation movement in both directions would be 0 millivolts. So, while the membrane when the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors open up tends to move towards 0, it would not reach there because by then voltage gated sodium channels in the membrane will open up and create an action potential there. If for some reason the voltage gated sodium channels were inactivated or acetylcholine continued to exist in the cleft, normally it would, rem it would be removed by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase in the cleft. If that enzyme was inactivated and therefore if acetylcholine continued to remain in the cleft or if there was an acetylcholine analog which cannot be removed by acetylcholine esterase, then after the first action potential after which sodium channels would remain inactivated, we will see that the membrane will reach zero potential. And it is because of that reason, because it reaches zero potential, zero millivolts, if the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors were open. That is why we should understand that these are non-specific channels which permit both sodium and potassium. We cannot technically call it a sodium channel because if it was a sodium channel, it would take the membrane to a positive potential which is the sodium equilibrium potential. That is why we need to understand that these channels responsible for the foot of the action potential in muscle in sensory neurons, in postsynaptic neurons, these are all non-specific monovalent cation or non-specific cation channels. If we had to locate those channels in the table, they are here, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are listed as non-specific monovalent cation channels and which also come as ligand gated channels. We have considered these channels in cell signaling 
as ionotropic receptors. Having said that, these are non-specific monovalent cation channels. If you do consider the current which flows during the initial depolarization, it is predominantly a sodium current and that is why probably some textbooks refer to these channels as sodium channels. And why is it a sodium current? Though this channel will allow both sodium and potassium to go past, sodium has an inward gradient, chemical gradient and potassium has an outward chemical gradient. But if you look at the electrical gradient, at this stage at around the resting membrane potential, the inside is negative. Therefore, sodium entry is favored whereas potassium exit is disfavored because the membrane is at the potassium equilibrium potential already. And therefore, this current is predominantly sodium. Nevertheless, we should not call it a sodium channel because experimentally, you find that only if these channels were open or if you created conditions where only nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are open, for example, you could have blocked the voltage-gated sodium channels with tetrodotoxin a toxin which blocks them specifically. So, if you do not allow the action potential to develop, then the membrane will reach 0 millivolts and therefore, we have to understand that this is not a sodium channel. If it was a sodium channel, it would have taken the membrane to a positive potential. Well, whatever we considered now is not too technical which is relevant only at the bench for an experimental biologist. It is important clinically if we have to understand why succinylcholine is used as a muzzle relaxant during surgical procedures and what is the cause of death in organophosphorus poisoning. Organophosphorus compounds are used as pesticides widely in India and it is an important cause of pharmacocytes. We will now move on to action potential in a postsynaptic neuron specifically the foot of the action potential, what is called the excitatory postsynaptic potential in this case. This is a synapse, that is the presynaptic neuron and here is the postsynaptic neuron. In excitatory synapses, the neurotransmitter that is released by the presynaptic neuron is glutamate and that would bind to glutamate receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. There are two types of ionotropic glutamate receptors, the non-NMDA or AMPA receptors and then the NMDA receptors. The AMPA receptors are non-specific monovalent cation channels like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and when glutamate binds to those channels, the channel opens and that is responsible for the early depolarization in a postsynaptic neuron. So, that is the AMPA receptor. We have now considered that the action potential contour is very similar in a sensory neuron, in a postsynaptic neuron and in the motor end plate in the skeletal muscle. The rest of the events are the same. It is only the early depolarization which differs from location to location. This early depolarization is called a receptor potential in a sensory receptor and it is due to transient receptor potential channels. It is called the end plate potential in the skeletal muscle and is due to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. It is due to the AMPA type of glutamate receptors in postsynaptic neurons and this early depolarization is called an EPSP in this location. The next important thing to understand is that these channels, be it the glutamate receptors or acetylcholine receptors or the transient receptor potential channels, these channels responsible for the early depolarization in these locations are located only in those sites. Those channels, the non-specific cation channels are not found along the length of the neuron or the rest of the muscle. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is located only at the motor end plate. If that is the case, 
we have to understand what causes the early depolarization along the length of the axon and along the rest of the skeletal muscle cell. We will take a small length of the axon and consider this. Now, let us suppose it is this axon and let us say experimentally we are stimulating that region or we are creating an action potential there. This ax action potential will transmit to either side. How does it transmit? Uh, in this region, what will cause the early depolarization? Here we have a dipole already. This region is positive inside and the adjacent regions are negative inside. They are in the resting state, whereas the reverse is true outside the cell. So there will be charge flow within the cell, within the cell membrane from the positive region to the negative and outside the cell membrane in the reverse direction. These can be called as capacitative charge flows because they happen on either sides of the membrane and they are not transmembrane ionic currents. These capacitative charge transfers are enough to depolarize adjacent parts of the membrane sufficiently to reach threshold so that action potentials can be set up there by opening of voltage gated sodium channels. So here we have taken the example and we have stimulated the nerve at one point and then the action potential can travel on either directions but in vivo in this neuron in this postsynaptic neuron action potentials will start at the axon hillock you would have learnt that at school and then they would transmit only in one direction they can't go in the backward direction because of a special property of sodium channels themselves we will see that just now we are moving on to a discussion on the upstroke of the action potential. We know it is due to voltage gated sodium channels. Let us see the events. The membrane is at rest and when there is a stimulus, there is an early depolarization due to different re reasons in different locations and that will cause opening of voltage gated sodium channels that will take the membrane towards the sodium equilibrium potential. These channels we saw already, they close quickly and delayed rectifiers open up to cause repolarization. After that, the delayed rectifiers will also close and the membrane will continue to remain in the resting state because of the leak potassium channels. Let us zoom the time axis and see the events more closely. The sodium channel is closed at the resting state it's closed here, but once the membrane voltage crosses the threshold, say minus 55 millivolts. Now, again, a word of caution is that there is no specific cutoff. What we have to think of is in terms of probabilities. As the membrane depolarizes, the probability of opening of sodium channels increases. But for simplicity, let us say that the sodium channels are open when the membrane voltage crosses a threshold voltage. Then we said it closes automatically and then it remains closed for the rest of the action potential. Now I have so shown the closed states here differently from the closed states in the resting state. How are they different? We could refer to the closed state here as the closed resting state whereas here we call it the closed inactivated state and that's the open state. Conventionally this is called closed open or active state and inactive state. I choose to call them closed resting open and closed inactivated for simplicity. To understand how this closed state is different from this closed state we have to go into Hodgkin Huxley's model, the HH model. Though earlier I have said that it is beyond the scope of this class, we will consider it briefly here. Hodgkin and Huxley postulated astonishingly from just your electrical recordings of sodium currents during a voltage clamp. They suggested that the sodium channels must have two types of gates. A type of 
activation gate and a type of inactivation gate. From their experiments, by fitting the activation profile of the sodium current to a sigmoid shaped curve, they suggested that the activation gate is not a single gate, but there must be at least three particles which are blocking the pore of the sodium channel. And when there is the initial depolarization, these three particles move out of the pore, permitting opening of the channel. In addition to describing the opening of the sodium channel purely from activation kinetics of the sodium current during the voltage clamp protocol, the opening of the sodium channel being due to movement of three activation particles out of the pore, Hodgkin and Huxley also noticed that even if the voltage was clamped at a depolarized state for a very long time, the sodium current would activate and then inactivate. There would be no sodium current, even though the voltage was held at a depolarized step. And by looking at the profile of inactivation, it fitted with an exponential fit. Hodgkin and Huxley proposed that there must be one inactivation gate. One inactivation gate or one particle moving into the pole is sufficient to block the pole. This is the model that we will see as a cartoon just now. We could think of the three activation particles being represented by that activation gate and that is the inactivation gate or a single inactivation particle. I am just showing it as gates for convenience. During the resting step, as long as the membrane voltage is below the threshold, you notice that the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is open. When you cross the threshold for opening those channels, the activation gate opens up or those three particles move out of the pore and the channel is in the conducting state. But very soon, the channel will inactivate, which means the inactivation particle will move into the pore. I am showing it here as the inactivation gate closing. And the channel will remain in that position for how long? The inactivation gate will open only when membrane voltage goes below the threshold. Only after that, the inactivation gate will open and the channel will move into the closed resting state. In the inactive state, you notice that the activation gate is open. Even if there was a second stimulus there, it is not possible for the channel to conduct because the inactivation gate is closed. So, this channel can conduct only if the membrane repolarizes, the inactivation gate opens up and only after that when there is a stimulus, the activation gate can open and the channel will move into the conducting state. This is the basis of the refractory period as well. During this period, even if you give another stimulus, no matter how strong that stimulus is, it is not possible for the sodium channel to conduct. This is also the reason why an additional class of potassium channels have to open up. Not just the non-gated channels, but a lot more potassium channels need to open up to quickly repolarize the membrane so that the sodium channel becomes responsive again, so that the nerve or the muscle can conduct a quick suction, succession of action potentials. We have already seen how the delayed rectifiers are important for abbreviating the duration of the action potential. This is a treasure. Here is a video where Professor Baker followed by Professor Alan Hodgkin himself performed the experiments on the squid axon where they demonstrate the voltage clamp technique. We will see that just now. The recordings are on a cathode ray oscilloscope. An electrode was first placed inside the axon by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1939 at Plymouth and by Curtis and Cole in 1940 at Woods Hole. Hodgkin and Huxley first made a plastic cell and mounted it on a platform which could be raised and lowered like a lift. As Professor Baker shows, the axon held by the cannula was then hung in the cell which was filled with seawater and connected to an external electrode.
the internal electrode, which was not attached to the lift, was then placed vertically above the axon with its tip in the cannula. Hodgkin and Huxley found that as the electrode entered the axon, a negative potential with respect to the external seawater of about 65 millivolts was obtained. This was the resting potential of the axon, and although its existence had long been suspected, this was the first time it had been directly measured. Moreover, when the axon was stimulating, the action potential did not simply fall to zero during the impulse, but became positive with respect to the outside, shown by the overshoot of the action potential. This important discovery suggested that the nerve membrane which at rest is mainly permeable to potassium becomes primarily permeable to another ion during excitation. This other ion is sodium, since if its concentration in the external solution was lowered, the action potential immediately became smaller, by an amount depending on the sodium concentration. If, as these experiments suggest, the action potential was dependent on the passage of ions across the membrane, it was obviously important to measure the currents carried by these ions. To do this, it is necessary to hold the internal potential at a chosen value. This is the powerful voltage clamp technique originally developed by Cole in America and applied by Hodgkin, Huxley and Kant. This technique requires that an extra electrode, the current electrode, be inserted into the axon. For this purpose, a double electrode was made by winding very fine silver wires around a thin glass capillary. As the wire, which was only 20 microns in diameter, was wound on, it was kept taut, as Sir Alan Hodgkin shows, by dangling a small piece of plasticine on the free end. The finished electrode consists of two entirely separate spirals, insulated where necessary by shellac varnish. While it is inserted in the same way as a simple electrode, the information it gives is quite different. As a change of potential is imposed on the axon, as seen in the top trace, the currents flowing across the membrane are revealed in the bottom trace. The early downward dip seen on the left, is the transient current carried by the influx of sodium ions. And it is superseded by an opposite and persistent current attributed to the outward flow of potassium ions. This again is a very good site to learn about the greatness of Hodgkin and Huxley's contributions. All the important aspects of Hodgkin and Huxley's work are stated here, that the kinetics of the conductance were unexpected, the mathematical description of the conductance patterns was unique and brilliant, the kinetics of the potassium conductance involved a power function, and the kinetics of the sodium conductance requires two power functions, an activation process and an inactivation process. The activation of the sodium conductance had a sigmoid shape and therefore they suggested that three particles were required to be moved out of the pole for activation to occur. An inactivation can be fitted by a single exponential and therefore it was enough for one particle to move into the pole and inactivate it. The Hodgkin-Huxley formulations have proved to be so successful in describing the conductance of the squid axon membranes that they have had a phenomenal lifetime of at least one half century and have also served as a framework by which equations for other excitable membranes are described. This is taken from UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. Now on to some interesting facts about the voltage gated sodium channel. These channels can be blocked by tetrodotoxin which is a toxin formed by puffer fish. These fish will puff up when they are about to be attacked by a predator to scare the predator. That's one of their survival tactics. The other one being elaboration of the toxin tetrodotoxin in their tissues. 
So it makes this fish poisonous. Predators will therefore avoid the fish. What is astonishing is that in nature, there are such toxins. The tetrodotoxin is so specific for the voltage gated sodium channel. So if it blocks the voltage gated sodium channel in the predator, the muscles will paralyze, the nerves will not conduct. It is so specific a blocker for voltage gated sodium channels that they say you can count channels depending on how much of the tetrodotoxin you applied to the tissue was used up, you can count the number of channels on that tissue. Similar to tetrodotoxin, there are other toxins in nature which are developed by organisms and which are so specific in what they block, very specific missiles. There are a number of scorpion venoms which are potassium channel blockers, blocking different types of potassium channels. B venom is a potassium channel blocker. Since ion channels are involved in multiple life processes, blockade of ion channels are not only toxic, they can also serve as therapeutics. A lot of research goes on into finding toxins like this in nature which can block various channels. The omega conotoxin from the sea snail is one such example. Local anesthetics, for example, what is infiltrated when you go for a tooth extraction, which makes the whole place numb, are also blockers of voltage gated sodium channels. So they block nerve transmission and therefore block pain. That completes our discussion on sodium channels. We will now see a little bit about the channels which repolarize the membrane quickly, the delayed rectifiers. Why are they called delayed rectifiers and why are they voltage gated? What is the voltage that gates them? The same voltage, the same type of depolarizing voltage which opens voltage gated sodium channels can also open the voltage gated potassium channels but after a delay. The voltage gated sodium channels open immediately after the depolarizing step but the delayed rectifiers open after a delay and therefore they are called delayed rectifiers. Because of the delay they allow the membrane to move to a positive potential. They allow the action potential to develop and then quickly abbreviate. We can now summarize. In this session, we have considered what are the causes for the early depolarization in three different instances, the sensory neuron, the postsynaptic neuron and skeletal muscle. We also saw some properties of voltage gated sodium channels and we saw why delayed rectifiers are called so. Why are they called rectifiers? Because they permit outward current preferentially. Dr. Vinay has spoken to you about rectification earlier. With this, we complete the discussion on action potentials. From here, Dr. Anand Baskar will discuss with you cardiac action potentials, but prior to that, he will do a session on calcium transporters on the cell membrane. We have discussed calcium transporters in various sessions. Under ion channels, we discussed calcium channels. Then we discussed calcium transporters, secondary active transporters, primary active transporters, etc. But calcium signaling is a very important signaling step in cells and therefore it helps to look at all these calcium transporters collectively and that is what Dr. Anand Baskar is attempting to do in the next session. After which he will discuss with you cardiac action potentials which at least some of which are calcium action potentials. Thank you for choosing to watch this NPTEL lecture.